Thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got some really, really great content. Uh, what you're about to see, it's going to be kind of magical. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got two great rock star uh, guests here today. Rocco, um, he is the head of growth at Reggie AI and James, head of customer operations at Reggie AI. They are going to do a cold, like an email sequence teardown, something you don't want to miss. So if you got friends who's, who might not have jumped on, send them the link. <laughs> I'm going to hand yeah. it over though to uh, Rocco and James to do a little bit more introduction and get right into the content. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, well, thanks everyone. First of all, thanks uh, for having us, uh, Sales Hacker. Um, uh, we've been longtime fans. We're obviously super partners with Outreach because our uh, we integrate directly with you and uh, feel like we're just one big happy family here, hopefully. Um, uh, again, uh, my name is Rocco. I'm head of growth here at Reggie. Uh, just so you know, Reggie is an AI copywriting tool that helps you write engaging content faster. Uh, and we're going to show how easy it is today by uh, tearing down a sales sequence that was actually submitted to us. So uh, each week we have folks that submit sales sequences to us and we actually tear them down live. I know tear down sounds maybe like a bad word, but it's actually fun and inviting and we're helpful. And, you know, we try to be nice <laughs> sometimes. Or, uh, sometimes we get off on a tangent if we see some things we don't like, but most of the time it's pretty nice. Uh, and we always give the sequence to whoever submitted an app or to, um, to try it again. So um, um, I have the uh, Sultan of Sequences here, uh, James, uh, and he's going to be tearing down most of the sequences. Say hello, James. That's right. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Really, really excited to be here. Happy end of month. Happy. Uh, wow, we're so close to July. It's the heart of the summer here. Um, and yeah, like Rocco said, we're going to go through a sequence that was submitted to us by Mike from Hired.com. Uh, so really excited to dig into that. We're going to get Mike, you know, a fully optimized sequence by the end of this. Um, and yeah, if we're ready to kick off, I can share my screen and, and kind of orient everybody with what we're going to be doing today. Let's do it. Uh, could you give me uh, the ability to screen share? Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stella said you need to change your LinkedIn profile to the Sultan of Sequences. Hey, I'm always looking for the next great LinkedIn headline, so <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> now, James, before uh, we share that, we're going to do one poll after. Perfect. Um, since you guys kind of introduced yourself, we want to get a better read of the audience, too. We're going to kick off a poll um, and just kind of get a read of, like, who's in our audience. Love it. Yeah, that'd be great. Launching now. Are you dropping <laughs> the poll in now? Yeah. yeah, it took me oh, a while cool. to figure out like where it was. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So response rate. What's your average reply rate? And would be good to look at like your total sequence reply rate here. Uh, in your ICP sales agent platform in outreach, it should tell you like your overall sequence average. We'd love to see what folks are are at. Yeah, it's always an interesting discussion. You know, that's that's one of the things that we do both during the teardowns, but also just in reviewing sequences is, you know, we really want to understand the correlation between like what in the content is, you know, generating that response, like what made it compelling enough to take the time out of your day to respond to. Um, so always curious to see what folks are, uh, are seeing on their end too. You know, it's that's interesting. Great. I'm seeing a lot of people respond zero to 10%. And, you know, this is kind of a myth buster for me because I thought it was like 13 to 24 or something yeah. like I had in my mind. So this is really cool. Yeah, and it, it, it varies uh, on a couple of different things, but even industry varies, you know, with with our industry, we're selling into sales folks. So maybe we'll generally see some higher open rates because, you know, sales folks just want to read the emails and we'll judge you. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll just take the meeting if you write a good email. Um, whereas if you're selling into like, Cybersecurity, for example, you're going to see generally much, much lower response rates and generally lower engagement as well. Uh, you sell into sales and marketing, you'll see higher engagement. Sell into, you know, uh, technical um, job titles or personas, you're going to see much lower because uh, they tend to want to avoid and avoid salespeople in general. So, um, James, are you seeing that on your end as well? 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I see the exact same thing, you know, because we talk with our customers a lot about that is, you know, when we come in, we do a baseline analysis to figure out where they're at today. We give them some comparison and analytics to let them know how they're comparing to other folks in their space. And then we use that as a baseline as we're going through, you know, to help them boost whatever rates, you know, they're most trying to do, which often are, you know, the reply rates. You know, what's going to lead to that next step? What's going to lead to that meeting getting booked and uh, hopefully closing more deals? Um, but Raka, you summed it up really well. It really does make a difference what industry you're prospecting out to, um, specifically, you know, what persona you're going after. And you can make a lot of gains with that uh, by being really targeted with your persona outreach. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to close this poll here, but uh, just to provide some insight. So we had 56% uh, of folks here are at zero to 10% in, re in response mm -hmm. rates. Um, 34% are at 10 to 20%. And then above that, we have some stars. 7% are at 20 to 30%. Wow. And then we have 3%, uh, just two folks in the whole crowd that are at 30% uh, plus. So uh, we're going to, we got something for everyone here. I, I can guarantee, even if you're at some of these top tiers, which also congratulations, I'm sure uh, you could teach us a thing or two maybe about some um, engagement and sales emails. Uh, we got something for you. I'm sure you'll be able to walk away with. Uh, something that'll help you boost these engagement rates. So um, please send, Michael Palmer said, <laughs> those that are getting 30% response rates, please send me your resume. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, uh, strong, strong move, it. Michael. We're always <laughs> be closing, Michael. Here. Always be yep. closing. Uh, cool. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this poll. And James, why don't you spin up the sequence and we can talk through it. Absolutely. All right, is my, is my screen coming through here? You see that first email on the screen? Absolutely. Perfect. So yeah, so just to orient everybody real quick, we're in the Reggie.ai platform right now. On the left-hand side, this is the sequence structure that we're working with. This is what was submitted to us, and we just rebuilt that in the platform you know, pretty quickly. That way we could you know, really do a compare and contrast on these. So what I'm going to do, you'll see here, these are just this A-B test. We were submitted you know, about one email each. So I've made a, an A-B test here so that we can make the edits that we're going to make and then compare the two results once we're done there. Uh, so we'll be able to go through all that there. Um, and on the sequence structure side itself, you know, it's really easy. We can actually drag and drop these steps if we want to rearrange anything here, uh, which is very handy from that perspective. Um, and then as we're going through this, one thing to pay attention to is we're going to be talking a lot about this analyzer on the right hand side of the screen here. This is going to help us get that email into the bounds that we want it to be for uh, based off of best practices for an outbound email like this. You know, we analyze 80 million emails a month right now. Um, so we're constantly feeding data back into the platform to help it generate you know, better, more relevant content and copy. Um, and we're going to take some time to edit this one down today and get, uh, get Mike from Hired.com a uh, new sequence that you can easily A-B test. Yeah, so let's talk about what type of sequence this is. So this is just a uh, traditional outbound, general mm -hmm. outbound sequence, what we're looking at here, James? That's exactly right. So this is a, a general outbound sequence. It's a very call-heavy sequence. I think it's one two, three, four, only five email steps itself uh, with a lot of calls peppered in throughout there, which, you know, it's one of those things I look at right away. Like you want to make sure that you're giving yourself one ample opportunity to get that at bat that you need to convert that prospect. But two, you also want to make sure that you give the prospect enough time to actually, you know, get help. Uh, because ultimately that's what we're trying to do here with any outbound sequences. You know, we're trying to make sure that we can provide a really relevant solution to a genuine pain that somebody has so we can make their life a little bit better. You know, we're in the business of helping people, not necessarily just trying to drive to a sale, right? That's right. That's right. Well, this first one seems a bit uh, stretched out. In terms it's, of a, it's, it's a little wordy at first glance. And, and one thing that I always like to call out at the beginning here is, is one, first of all, you know, Mike, if you're out there listening, appreciate you submitting uh, uh, for this because one, like building your sequence and sending it out is an act of bravery all on its own. Like putting your own <laughs> content out into the world can be really yeah. scary. Uh, so we're going to take good care of you today. And, and one of the things that I like about this is the subject line from the gate is like, it's short, it's simple, and it's clear what the email is going to be about. Um, one of the things that I like to incorporate into my emails when I'm looking at subject lines is I, I want to, one, I, I don't tend to use punctuation in, in my subject lines. I feel like that kind of just gets in the way uh, of the overall message. But the other thing that I really try to optimize for is like, how can I make the subject line look natural enough looking 
uh, that it's going to be eye-catching, uh, but also compelling enough uh, that you'd want to open it and, and read more. And in the event of something like this, where the focus is on really, you know, finding those better candidates faster, like I might just do something simple like hiring um, mm -hmm. or, you know, find top talent, um, just something really, really simple like that. Yeah. You know, one thing you could do to personalize it a bit, and I'm sure uh, all this data is out there anyway, is uh, specific roles they may be hiring for. Um, mm -hmm. You could say about the, you know, CTO role uh, in, yeah. in the subject line. 100%. You could, you could exactly do that. You can either do that in the subject line or we can do it in this first line here. And Rocket, to that point, you know, they're doing some general personalization here, uh, which is great. You know, they're calling out, hey, I saw, you know, you're hiring for multiple tech and sales openings that have been posted for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. We specialize in tech and sales hiring. Would you be open to growing your, your candidate pipeline with the best talent? So one of the recommendations that I, I would make here, especially if this first email is going to be a, a manual step in that process, is you can really personalize this very specifically if you're going after direct accounts. One of the things that I love to do when it comes to uh, this type of email is calling out a specific job post and specifically how long it's been posted. Uh, you know, anything over that like 20 day mark is like really great low hanging fruit to call out to because it could indicate that they're having some trouble finding the next best candidate, right? Yep. I think that's really yep, cool because we, we, you know, talk a lot about showing empathy, you know, especially we're in this digital world and it's kind of hard to show that empathy when you're not face to face, but like doing that research and just knowing like, hey, I know specifically what you're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of just shows like, yeah, I've done my research. I, I know, like I can feel your pain. I've been looking looking into you. 100%. And so, James, tell me, okay, I gotta ask, what do you guys think about emojis and subject lines? Have to ask. Yeah, it's one of those things, like I recommend testing it out. You know, there's yep. no shame in doing an A-B test to see one, how it impacts deliverability and two, how it impacts the, the open rates. Um, and, and I, you know, I like getting more things like that into the system over time uh, and especially testing those things because ultimately like what you're doing today, you know, four or five months from now, isn't necessarily going to work again, because as people are being prospected constantly, they're, they're like kind of tuning their own mental spam filters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an emoji or something eye catching on the subject line or that opening line can serve as a pattern interrupt, which could actually get the prospect to open and read that email. So, so I'm all for testing things like that. That's awesome. Thanks. We're actually seeing, uh, James, I just pulled up our insights and over the past 90 days. So this is over, um, this is over a thousand emails, a thousand seventy seven emails. We're seeing uh, a 76.8% open rate with uh, emails that in, include an emoji. It doesn't tell us that it's in the subject line exactly, but it says the email does include an emoji. And then uh, in terms of reply rate, we're seeing an average of 2.23%. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's amazing that you guys can pull that, that data right there at your fingertips. So that's really cool. It's helpful that's, when you're writing emails. <laughs> it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, so we also, oh, have a, I'm so sorry. We, <laughs> I'm like interrupting, but we have a question from the audience. My first step is a personalized video. Vidyard. Do you think that indicating that in the subject line is enticing enough? Example name, I recorded you a video. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's, you know, one way to, to really get um, some interest there. Um, we're definitely seeing, you know, more, more video based content coming up early in the sequence. The only thing that I uh, am hesitant on with that is typically if you're going to embed a video, you're either putting in a file or some sort of link to something. Mm -hmm. And if it's the first email in that sequence, you haven't necessarily confirmed deliverability yet. And including links and things like that could negatively impact, you know, your sender score and things like that. So I'm just careful to deploy links and videos in the first email. Uh, but once they've gotten that first email, then you can get a little bit more creative with it. So I personally love a video follow up. Um, I think that can be really handy. It helps put a face to the name uh, while also um, hopefully getting some more contextual information in there for them. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question as well. That's an excellent question. So what, what I'm looking at here is like, I'm really starting to look at the, the message length, right? So you'll see, you know, on average between 30 and 110 words are gonna maximize that reply rate. And the important thing is to make it, you know, as direct and contextual as you can. So now that I've, I've altered this opening line a little bit, I'm probably gonna cut out this next part. 
uh, because we've established the relevancy on why we're reaching out, right? And now I'm gonna yep. start to edit this down. And, and what I wanna do with like this block of text here is I wanna make this a little bit more direct um, because it's, it's telling me a lot of information in some short staccato sentences, uh, but it can be more direct, right? So what I'm gonna do in Reggie is I'm just gonna highlight that and I'm gonna click shorten. And Reggie's gonna take some of that language and, and condense it down. It's not bad. Not bad, it's shorter. I'm gonna take yeah. out the word crazy. I'm gonna say fast paced. Mm -hmm. And why'd you do that? So I did that because crazy is one of those words and you'll see here you know, with Reggie at the bottom here, uh, we're detecting and filtering for any gender bias and inclusion language. And crazy is one of those words that, that can be you know, very exclusive uh, to certain you know, subsets of people. Um, it's definitely one of those things I remember being very young and it was like, you know, it's one of those words you throw around a lot and you just slowly phase mm -hmm. it out. We should be phasing that type of language out in our emails as well. And Reggie can help you do that on the way too. I think that's amazing. Like, I, I also just love how it's the AI, super intelligent. <laughs> we talked about it, it's in its name. It, it calls out, we're not an agency or a job board. Like just saying what you're not, like introducing yourself as what we are, but then also saying what you're not really got my attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what 100%, right? Yeah it's, yeah, it's a little bit of a nicer sense, a little bit more clear what we're reaching out for. Uh, and then in this next line, we're, we're doubling down on that, right? We're, we're calling out like, hey, we can actually help you hire faster. Uh, we can see, you know, an increased response rate on that. Uh, one of the things I might do here, I, I might do the same thing again, just to see if I can get some additional, uh, more direct language here. But the other thing that you saw me do um, when I was doing that is I, I just added a line break here. And I did that because when I'm reading an email and editing an email, one of the things that I'm thinking about is how is this going to play on mobile? 60% uh, of prospects are reading and responding to their email on mobile. Uh, and Reggie makes it really easy to see what that view is going to look like. So you'll see the blocking question was right here. And look at the difference between this with that line break added in and then this without the line break added in. Um, it's just making it a little bit easier to consume and every step that you can take to make the email easier to understand and consume for your prospect who undoubtedly is very busy, the better off you're going to be and the higher chance you'll have of actually getting that response. That's right. Yeah, it's just these walls of text that you might show up with on mobile. Uh, people just tend to gloss over and especially when you have such important uh, data and stats right in the middle of that, they're never going to see it. 100%. And you, you see, I see that you have like that line, um, the level of engagement means companies can hire on average in 37 days or less. So that's mm -hmm. like a stat, something that you want to pull out is, is that also one of the reasons why you want to kind of be like on its own? Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. Exactly. I, those, those statistics can really behave as like headlines, right? Like right. I want to make it very clear, the most impactful information for this prospect, especially in this intro email, because I want to optimize for the most success here. But I also want to make sure knowing that most prospects probably aren't going to respond until the third or fourth step. I want to make sure that I'm constantly giving them new information and relevant information to work off of. So when I do follow up with them or when I get them on the phone during one of my call steps, I can reference those things that are really impactful and important. They've got all the information right there for them That's yeah i might even that. use 37 days or less in a subject line yeah um mm. because it's it's a it's a big claim right anyone who's hired uh and went through the hiring process uh 37 days is a pretty reasonable amount of time and short amount of time to get a really qualified candidate um i might actually just put it 37 days or less <laughs> personally um, yeah yeah so we we actually use this we use a um we, one of our subject lines that works well, it's called eight of 10 prospects. And it's just an intriguing, interesting data point that you lead with. And we tie it back in the email talking about how eight of 10 prospects would rather communicate over email, which obviously backs up our, our tool. Uh, so for this, they're going to read through and now you have this big claim that you're starting when they're like, well, what does this mean? And then now you're going to tie it through. And when they get to that sentence, it's going to just tie it all together. And they're going to get that aha moment. Yeah, that's that is a work of beauty. <laughs> I must <What>? say. <laughs> and now I that subject line is much shorter than what we started with. Mm -hmm. Is that like mm -hmm. do you guys have a sweet spot that you guys say, okay, that is this is the number we're shooting for? 
Yeah, absolutely. So right now we're seeing like anything over seven words, uh, you kind of see diminishing returns on. And what we're trying to do there, in addition to the mobile view, you can also see what this is going to look like on Outlook and Gmail, uh, which can give you a lot of insight on how this is going to actually play when it lands in the inbox. Um, so you'll see here, because of how we've structured this first line, first line right now, you've got your compelling subject line, 37 days or less and you're including that customized personalized intro right in the preview text. So they know like this is something that's relevant to me or something that I'm doing right now. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I love that that data is right there at a glance too, right while you're composing. And uh, we had a couple of questions here. Uh, Natalie, thanks for submitting. For the first email, should we add humor or stick to formal? That's a really good question. Uh, and Rocco, I know you've got some opinions on this, but but you know, briefly, the, the way that I look at it is it depends a lot, one, on the persona. Um, I've noticed that just anecdotally with sales and marketing folks, you know, humor can play really well. Uh, whereas like folks in like, you know, like operations leaders in manufacturing or like very like like CISOs and things like that, you know, humor doesn't necessarily play as well as like data, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it all depends on who you're trying to talk to. Uh, but but Rocco, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, depends on the persona. You know, humor is humor can play well with certain personas. Uh, Natalie, I'd be interested to understand who you're targeting uh, to understand tone, right? Um, uh, you, you always want to write in the tone of the persona that you're targeting versus the tone that you may want to write in, um, and try to think about how they want to receive the information, uh, and then back it up with that tone. And Natalie says targeting C CEOs. So does that say lean towards data, lean towards mm -hmm. results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, lean towards brevity. The most it, important. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Lean, lean, lean towards brevity. Like the, that C-suite persona, I think it's tough to get their attention for long enough. So uh, the more consumable you can make it, uh, the briefer you can make it, uh, you're usually a little bit better off. You know, and that's a good lead in. Liam writes a, a submitted, any thoughts on email word length? Shorter the better? Absolutely shorter the better. Um, so like our range typically starts out, you know, you wanna be between, I think it's like 30 and 110 words. Uh, 110 words is a maximum, which, you know, imparts a reading time of, you know, somewhere between 30 and 40 seconds. Um, so enough time for the brain to process what's going on, actually make a decision on whether or not, you know, it's relevant to them. Um, but yeah, definitely optimizing for shorter. Like if you can pack a lot of like highly relevant value in the first couple of sentences, uh, you've got a much, much greater chance of getting that reply. You know, as we look at it and how you've broken out like one sentence, I, someone once called it bro tree where, you know, you're putting like <laughs> statements in one line and then you skip line, you yeah. put another statement. And I think it's just to kind of reduce the fatigue of, I saw some research that I can't believe somebody actually researched this, like the amount of time that I moves, that I moves from left to right to read something and the fatigue mm -hmm. that ensues because of that can diminish, you know, their reading time. Um, yeah. But like, how do you feel about the bro tree format of, a, of an email? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I think about it from like a, a consumer perspective, because even in B2B selling, like we're all like we're all consumers. Right. right. And if you think about if 60 percent of folks are like reading and responding on their phone, you know, you can think about how people consume other pieces of content on their phone. You can think about like the length of tweets, you know, Instagram captions, things like that. And, you know, it kind of imparts that that folks are very accustomed to being able to consume a lot of content quickly, but when it's organized in a way that allows them to process shorter sentences uh, each at a time. And so breaking up the email in this way and letting those sentences like play on their own is kind of that, that headline piece that I was talking about earlier, kind of triggers that effect psychologically uh, so that folks can consume it and understand it a little bit easier. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I think if, you, if you look at like, you know, the, the sales influencers are going to hate me for this, but if you want to learn how to write great sales copy, stop listening to salespeople. Uh, the, the folks that you should be researching are great copywriters. And some of the great copywriters, Joseph Sugarman, Dan Kennedy, Ryan Dice, uh, Frank Kern, uh, these folks know how to write great copy. Um, and uh, and you're, going to see, you're going to see patterns in the writing. Uh, you're not only going to see the linguistic patterns, but you're going to see the visual patterns. And those visual patterns matter. Uh, Marcella, to your point, it's, it's about consumption, it's about scannability, and it's about breaking things up into digestible chunks. 
That's great. That's, that's absolutely right. Rocket, that gave me a great idea for, for an ad headline. We can just have your face in black and white and say, sales leaders hate him. <laughs> <laughs> Gangbusters. I love that. There. Next ad campaign. Done yeah. for you. <laughs> we'll send that over. <laughs> and I can't, I, questions keep coming in. So um, I just mm. want to, uh, Ali, I'm sorry if I just butchered your name. Um, thoughts on leaning into industry stats in the first message versus later on. For example, 80% of persona are saying ABC. Mm -hmm. So hit them yeah. right from the get-go. Yeah, part of part of it depends on like what what perspective you're coming from. I know like one of the areas that our customers see a lot of success with is if they're, you know, they're connected to a brand that's got um, you know, some recognition or they're a brand with recognition, like even putting in the subject line that data point uh, can actually induce that response and add that credibility in the beginning there. Um, and we've definitely seen success with like referencing, you know, like a Gartner statistic or something like that in the first couple of lines, you know, kind of painting the picture for where folks are generally at right now to quantify the pain a little bit more specifically. Uh, it's definitely something worth testing out. That's great. And um, before we, you'll probably answer this um, as we get down through this email, any advice on good CTAs? Yeah, yeah. We're getting there, yeah. It, it, that's exactly right. So kind of the last thing that I'm looking at with this, this intro email here is these, these bottom two lines, you know, about the 37 days or less, uh, they're kind of redundant. This the second one especially, um, because we can kind of impart that knowledge from that first one. So in the interest of just making it more direct and brief, I would just cut that out. Uh, but this CTA here, I actually really like. We're starting to observe that softer CTAs, especially in the beginning of the sequence, uh, can tend to play a little bit better from a response rate. So, you know, things like, would this make a difference to your job? Would this make a difference to your business? Interested in learning more? Uh, sound like it's worth a quick call to discuss further? Like things like that that are a little bit softer and less direct on like a specific day and time tend mm -hmm. to play well earlier in the sequence. And then as we go through that, we can start to get a little bit more aggressive and direct with what we're asking for. And, you know, would you want to augment that CTA with, if you're interested in learning more, like dropping a link or is it just let them respond? You know, do you want them to go off cycle or go out of the sequence and, you know, since you're posing a question, kind of give them some resource to noodle on a little mental floss and then they come back to you or yeah, just leave it, leave it open. That's a perfect question. So, so with intro emails like this, you know, I want to, I want to pack that intro email full with like the most relevant information I can so that they don't have to leave or go anywhere. Okay. Uh, like that intro email should be enough to at least generate that interest to get them to respond. And then if it doesn't, then you can incorporate some of those pieces in your follow up. And, and we've got a couple follow up steps in here that we'll talk about, but I like to continue to include things as much as I can in text, you know, those proof points, those credibility darts, those statistics, uh, because I don't want folks to get fatigued with needing to click around too much and kind of lose sight of what we're, mm. we're trying to drive as the next step, because we can get them all the information they need once they respond. Uh, so we're trying to optimize for that reply, really. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've been, um, I know I've gone down rabbit holes when I've got an intro email, I'm like, huh, that sounds interesting. What do they do? And then I'll jump off and like, go <laughs> immediately go Google them. And then like, get distracted and like lose my train of thought and what I was looking for. So that's really great. Um, another question just came in. Perfect. <laughs> Michael, thank you for submitting. Uh, general question, what are your opinions on sales teams that don't utilize sales engagement platforms versus those who do not? That's a really good question. Uh, you know, the short answer to that is I, I think you're making your job tougher than it needs to be. Um, you know, there's just so many options to, to automate pieces of your job each day uh, to reduce the friction that you find and just trying to do that day to day work. So, you know, I definitely recommend I, I mean, like I started my career using outreach um, and it changed, you know, my whole concept of what I thought I could accomplish in my day to day. Uh, because of how powerful the automation is and like not only like getting the emails out but keeping me on track um, so i think of like sales engagement platforms as like kind of an accountability partner uh, to make sure you've got everything you need um, and the other great thing about doing that earlier on is it's going to make it that much easier to scale uh, because you're going to have all of your content all of your sequences and all of your data in a space already that's consolidated and easy to grow upon yeah i was i was on a workshop prior to this uh, just to back that up um and the, and the workshop's about like startup sales strategy in a bear market. And the, the key you want to think about right now, 
just overall. And if, you know, if you're an AE or, you know, SDR on this call, maybe this is, you know, uh, something for you to think about as well. Like the term is revenue efficiency. And what that means is how can we get efficient with who we have at our disposal as, a, as an org today, right? Because a lot of times you're seeing hiring freezes, et cetera. So how do we get the most out of what we have? You know, something like a sales engagement platform actually produces revenue efficiency because it's going to ensure that every single lead is going to get touched 16 to 20 times. Uh, from a rep perspective, it's going to ensure that your tasks are lined up perfectly every single day and you're going to get be able to get the most out of your day uh, as opposed to folks who don't. Uh, the other thing I'll say is like if you're not already using uh, one, um, your competitor is. And it, I mean, like it's just so... It's just a required tool, in my opinion, at this point for, for a sales team. You know, I think we're at that point now where it's like, you know, you hear of a company that doesn't use a CRM and you're like, wait, what? How is that mm -hmm. possible? <laughs> and it's kind of, yeah, right, yeah. And it's kind of like for those sales teams without a sales execution platform, it's kind of like, oh, how do you survive? Yeah, um, really. <laughs> Um, another question, and you know, yeah. this was one that was actually on top of my mind too. Mike Kennedy, thanks for submitting. Is using "hey" too abrupt and informal in an intro email? So, mm -hmm. like, I've gone through that too. I've gotten emails that says "hey," you know, such and such. Actually, it's "hey," and sometimes not even my name. And I'm like, "Hey, you don't know me like that." <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Anna. <laughs> That's not even my name. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that that's that's definitely the worst. You don't want, you don't want the the data to to put the wrong name in the variable tag. Um, yeah, it's one of those things. Like I think about it a lot, depending on the the persona uh, that I'm reaching out to, um, and and we fluctuate between what we use a lot. Like sometimes we'll just do we'll start with the first name. Sometimes we'll actually start with just the first sentence and like put that first name variable tag somewhere in that sentence, um, which you know again acts as another pattern interrupt. Um, Rock, I'm curious if you know any any data on it offhand, but I know just like anecdotally, um, I haven't seen too much of a difference uh, on on like the differences between like hey and hi. Um, mm -hmm. But what I have seen is that like there is opportunity, you know, the higher up uh, in seniority that you're going to be a little bit more formal just to make sure you don't inadvertently, you know, offend anybody. Yeah, no, I don't have any data on that portion of it. You know what I end up looking at is uh, can I fit it in on mobile or not? And can yes. they see like what that first sentence is? So sometimes I go back and forth on there. You know, I tend to, and sometimes it's like your own style because as much as we can tell you what best practices are, like don't become a robot, you know, put your own personality in your emails because you are who you are. Uh, for me, I tend to be short uh, with my email writing. So like even this first line here, like I would get rid of, hey, I would get rid of I, I would get rid of are you uh, so it would say like blank saw that you're hiring for blank still trying to find someone to fill the position because I just write in short choppy like sentences where some folks would prefer to write more formal um, uh, you know and, and and just going back to the persona again to James's point like you know it's always it's always good to start there 100 percent 100 percent and you know what, um, I know this is a, like a, a hiring platform. And so, you know, looking to see if they have like current uh, roles that they're hiring for, that's great research, great uh, evidence that you've done your research. But let's say you do, a, um, you do some research and you see that they have like bad news. Do you, do you file it away? Do you just make a note and say, okay, I'm going to send this out in like a couple of weeks? Like what's that? Do you guys have any advice on like how long you should wait or? how you should handle that if you find maybe not some great news in the research. Yeah. You just, you just want to make sure you're just not coming off tone deaf yeah. uh, with whatever news it is, right. Whether it's the market news or COVID news or, you know, election news or, mm -hmm. you know, Supreme court ruling news, you know, yeah. uh, just be aware of what's going on in the world from a macro and micro perspective and ensure that you just don't come off tone deaf would be my suggestion. That, that, that'd really be my suggestion as well. Um, you know, I, I think in the events, you know, the, the thing that I always flex back to is like, put myself in the prospect shoes and like, try to imagine like where they're at based off of the research you've done on them, you know, where the world's at right now and, and ask yourself, like, is, is what I'm trying to, am I reaching out to them because I 
can genuinely solve a problem that they have at this time or am I reaching out to them because I have to meet my quota? Uh, if the later, uh, maybe put them on pause for a little bit and come back to them uh, mm -hmm. once you have a more relevant reason to reach out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think that is also part of that empathy that we were talking about. You're human, still has all day humans and yeah. Yeah. Totally. larger let's scope of the, it. Let's get to that next uh, mm -hmm. email here because I think we're going to run yep. over <laughs> before yeah. we get to the sequences. I know, I know. These questions are great though. One, one thing yep. that I'll note about this, um, so we've got the emails here. We got a call and a LinkedIn connection request on the same day. I think that's a great tactic, you know, put a face to the name, love getting kind of those three triple touches out in the first day. Then there's a little bit of a break. So you're letting them cool off a little bit, trying to call a couple days later and then trying to reach them over in mail. Uh, nothing wrong with that. The only thing I might recommend in here is, is we're, we're actually not emailing them again for a little bit over another week. Um, so, you know, in some cases, depending on the persona that I'm reaching out to, I might want to shorten that a little bit. Um, but, you know, that, that really depends on what you're looking for. Um, so this next email, uh, very brief, right? Just the, the classic, any thoughts, uh, bump. Um, I have a lot of feelings about bump steps, um, as a prospect who gets, you know, prospected with, you know, a bunch of bump steps, you know, every week, uh, what I find and what I've heard from other folks who are being prospected in that style is that it's, it's kind of tiring, especially if you can't reference back, like the reason that somebody's reaching out. Um, so with things like this, I always like to include just like a quick refresher on, on why I'm reaching out, right? Uh, because like you can't lose sight of the relevancy in there. Um, while it's very easy to funnel out a bunch of any thoughts emails, you owe it to the prospect to try to get them either more information on how you can solve their pain or to at least you know refresh why you reached out to begin with. So one of the things I like to do here, uh, I like to use our AI assistant to figure out you know how to say different things. Um, I use this for pretty much any follow-up email that I write. Um, and literally all I'm doing is I'm putting in the company name, I'm describing what they do and the problem that they solve. And then I'm including any like SEO based keywords uh, to help me figure out how to write that. Um, so like right away, you'll see here, it gave me this great chunk right here. Um, so I might do something like any thoughts on my previous email as a refresher, hired as the world lead talent acquisition platform, da, 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 da. Uh, and I might just keep it at that. I, I might not even keep that second line or I might do another line break on that line and then finish it with a, would it be worth a quick call to learn more? You know, this is, uh, I think a great lead into, mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I, I butcher your name, Kirill. Kirill's question, what's the best way to add a meeting invite? Like if you were, you know, deeper down in the sequence, um, is it a direct calendar link and offer to a few select times, or do you simply leave it as, are you interested? Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things that, that I like to do there. Um, I typically don't use uh, like any meeting links or anything like that. I find those to be somewhat limiting. So what I like to make use of is like, I love using uh, like variable tags in my, my calls to action, right? So like how's, you know, weekdays from now three to learn more, like things like that. So you're still being a little bit more direct about when you'd like to connect, but still giving them the flexibility in the room to propose a different time, right? As opposed to if you just include like some meeting links, like you're often going to have like a list of three or four times that work, each one's a link, and it's going to make the email look really long and a little overwhelming, gotcha. right? Gotcha. Mandy said, just said something in the chat here. She said, don't you think prospects get annoyed with salespeople when the prospect accepts your invite on LinkedIn and then the sales rep immediately calls or emails that prospect? A hundred percent, a hundred percent they get annoyed. Yeah, if you go up to this, um, I actually took a look at this, but if you go up to that initial first day, that invite um, comes after the call in the email. Uh, I would assume that it's, you know, you're only going to send that request if you've already sent a call and emailed and they didn't pick up first the other way around. Um, right. If, if that's not a, something that you feel is, um, you know, something you want to do, maybe you could just uh, view their profile on that first day and then push out that request to day four or keep it on a separate day without any calls or emails. Right. 100%. 
I could not agree more with that. And, and the thing to remember too about reaching out to LinkedIn is like, you don't want to pitch slap anybody. You want to give them, you know, ample room to understand like why you're connecting, but you don't want to just like throw your solution at them. Like try to make a genuine mm-hmm. human connection. Like so much of sales and customer success and everything we do in business to business is like so relationship based. And you wouldn't necessarily just walk up to a stranger on the street and like start talking about your talent acquisition solution, right? So don't do that on LinkedIn either. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You know, pitch slap really stood out to me too. I'm going to have to use that license to use if I may. <laughs> you know, as we're going through these cadences here or the sequences, um, do, do, do we have to keep in mind that, you know, marketing has sent out something and so I want to do a follow-up and maybe tie it in together, reference that, or, you know, what, what's any suggestions there? I think it's so powerful when marketing and the sales works together very closely. Um, you know, marketing is often producing such great content. And if it's done in a, in a silo and doesn't make its way to the sales folks or in the reverse, if the sales folks aren't giving feedback to the marketing department on how things are landing, uh, you're losing a lot of really valuable data on, on where you could actually be, you know, generating those replies. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's great. You know, one of the things we talk a lot about at Reggie with our customers is like setting up a content committee. I know it's an outreach best practice as well, um, but that just ensures that like everybody that is, you know, kind of a stakeholder in that process has a seat at the table to give feedback, to make suggestions and to help, you know, elevate that brand voice over time. That's a really, really great suggestion. And I noticed that, you know, so far uh, we have not dropped any value pieces, no assets, no links, PDFs, anything like that. Um, is there like an, a waiting period three days before we call? <laughs> Yeah, so so I tend to not start to incorporate um, like specific assets that are going to take them out of the email thread, probably until the first time that I start a new thread with them. Um, so I, I like to get them through that first thread, chock it full of value added information. And then when I, if I reach the point where I can just start a brand new thread with them, I might, I might do things like what we're doing here, you know, and linking out to some G2 reviews so that they can see firsthand the impact we've had on customers. The other thing that I really love to do with these is I love having statistics like that. Did you know that hired helps recruiters save 45 hours of work per hire? And then following that up with, if you'd like to see some more benefits from that, check out this case study. Uh, That can be a really powerful way to incorporate some of those marketing assets into your sequence. That's great. Yep. You could call it out right in the following sentence where you could say, you know, Apple reduced hiring, hiring time by X percent you know, it's right after this um, and, and link to the case study. Uh, the one thing yeah. you, want to, you think about just to back up uh, James's point is, is, is on this reintroduction. You know, you want to make sure, number one, uh, in your emails, you have, you have one big idea that you're, that you're theming it through those uh, reply emails. So in that first thread of emails, technically you'll see, you know, two different threads within one sequence. So you'll see those first two to three emails you know, you'll see two replies and then you'll reintroduce, you know, do a reintroduction step here. You know, think of one big theme um, and stick to it versus if, if, at least through those three emails. Um, and if you, if, if, if you, if you have a link to support it, great. Um, but don't kitchen sink the, the emails uh, and provide different data points and different themes and try different. We've seen, you know, folks uh, just try different bullets each time. So meaning, you know, they're going to try a different pain point and value proposition on every email. Uh, it tends to have the reverse effect because what you're trying to do is maximize the stacking effect there, right? On that same theme, on that same theme. And if you have a targeted pain point, we always stick to what we call the three P's uh, in our uh, messaging architecture, which is, you know, targeted persona with a relevant pain point and value proposition. Um, stick to those three throughout the thread um, and try not to veer off. 100%. And you know, if I've, I've made the mistake before and you can tell me, like tear down that, that idea is like trying to discover that pain point and then hit them with like four or five bullets, which might be a bit overwhelming. I'm feeling mm-hmm. like now looking at these, <laughs> looking at what we're doing here. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So yeah, yeah this, um, to, to your point, you know, bullets, bullets could... Bullets sometimes work, sometimes don't. I think it just depends. I wouldn't go over three bullets if you're going to use them. Um, you know, ten, multiple choice emails. We've seen some data around links. Um, you know, you want to choose two to three bullet points if you're if you are going to add them. But yeah, um, it could work. 
you know, the interesting thing is my wife's in PR and like the, um, that, you know, they do cold emailing, but it's a completely different pitch. Right. Um, but one of the best practices are bullet points, like long set of bullet points, um, or in sales, mm-hmm. it doesn't work as well. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it is interesting starting to look at the differences in, in how those, you know, emails are consumed and, and managed. And it's something to be aware of too. Um, you know, and, and you kind of, you have the ability to flex back to best practices when that happens, you know, uh, want the email to be easy to consume, easy to understand. One of the things I love to do, especially if I'm working with an email that I feel like might be a little bit lengthy, is I start to read it out loud uh, because people naturally read uh, the way that they speak to each other. So if you find yourself tripping up over words as you're saying it out loud, your reader is likely going to trip up on that as well when they're consuming it themselves. So that can also help in the, uh, the editing process. That's great. Thank you. I noticed that you uh, left a PS there. I haven't seen that very often. So I, I like it got my attention. Like, oh, what else? What else you got to say? A little side note. <laughs> exactly. And, and that, that's exactly why I include it there. Because what it does is if you're going to include something additional like this, you got to draw attention to it. Um, and just leaving it as kind of a loose line that's hanging there, it might get lost in like the email signature and everything there. Um, so, you know, I love doing a little PS, some little fun about that. It's just another example of a pattern interrupt that you can try out. Um, and it's one of those things, it's worth testing, you know? Yep. Question on signatures, like having avatars, profiles, quotes in your signature links, you know, like some people have pretty robust signatures there. Um, are any thoughts or guidance on what you've seen as far as the responses or do people click into those? Um, yeah, yeah. So so I, I've definitely got a, a, a bias towards this. You know, I like signatures that are just like very simple, not like super fluffy with HTML or things like that, specifically because you don't know how every browser that you might hit is going to process that information. And it can end up making like that bottom section of your email just look like a mess if it's, you know, like for, like, for example, like Outlook sometimes will block images. So if you've got like your picture there, it's going to look like a broken link, which, you know, just from a first impression standpoint, like I don't want to run the risk of doing that. Gotcha. Yeah, I've never replied to an email based on the signature style. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. More um, questions from the audience before we go on. Yeah. Thoughts on emails being sent consecutively as a thread versus individually? Yeah, so big, big proponent of threading. Um, because again, want to make it very easy for that prospect to get the most relevant information for them all in one spot. Um, so it's the same thing I was talking about, you know, back up here with that, uh, like thoughts bump, like I want to give them some more information, but I want to make it easy for them to scroll back down and see what I said before. I don't want them to go dig through their inbox. Uh, and then the only, then when I bring in a new thread, it's going to be after a little bit of time that I've let them kind of sit, take another stab at it and see what we can produce there. Yeah, there, there's a there's a relationship stacking effect that happens with threading, um, and you tend to get into the inbox with deliverability with threads much better as well. Two things to think about as well. Um, in this yeah. Case, so yeah, yeah. And, thread. and and interestingly enough, like this this email here is actually taking a tactic that I I really love for like the SDRs that might be doing that outreach. So this email is a manual email and the direction here isn't to use this entire email, it's to choose one of these quotes that's gonna be more relevant to whichever prospect you're sequencing at that time and to use that one. Um, And I think that that's a great use of a customer quote. It's a great way to get like more resources to your reps, uh, which is, you know, really helpful. Just like making their jobs easier is gonna then make your job easier. A lot of downline benefits there. The only thing I'd maybe change is like if there's a way to like shorten the quote a little bit for just the most impactful information in it um, is again kind of that headline type uh, area. That's kind of what I'd be looking for here. Do you guys have any uh, preferences like that? That looks like a block of text that's part of the email, but should it look more like a quote, like more of an indent, italicized, like or does that matter? Does it even matter? <laughs> That, that, that's I like the italicized idea. Yeah, I, I love to italicize my quotes. Uh, typically, I'll italicize the quote itself and then put the like like who it's from in bold. Um, or I'll do what they're doing here and like actually link out to the case study that it's referencing. 
Um, and again, it, it's kind of like what Raga was saying as far as like the consumption goes, like you, you want to do things that are going to draw the reader's eye to where the most impactful information is. So if I see something like that that's italicized, like my eye is naturally going to go to that because it's different than the rest of the email. Um, so definitely something that's worth testing there. Yeah, I might change this open. I might just remove the whole, the entire sentence and start with quote. Yep. Um, I do like the opening of the quote. I'd probably break these up into two emails personally. Yep. Um, but I, I do like the second opening. Like since our inception, we've doubled in size each year. Like that feels strong to me. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, and yeah, and since we're opening with it, we don't need this uh, this hyphen here at the beginning. We can just lead in straight with the quote. Uh, this is another area where like I might nix this first name variable tag, start with the quote, um, and then like either insert that into the call to action uh, to get that personalization in there, or just leave it hanging. Uh, I don't I don't think there's a problem with that. Like you can kind of let it play either way. Yeah, you know, Cynthia had some uh, mm -hmm. great call out. She's saying how you're really going through with the email, showing the thought that was put into the email. Um, if you guys want anyone in the audience want um, email grader, <laughs> I just mm -hmm. want to make sure I shout that out, Rocco James, that you guys have an email grader coming out, right? That uh, will be a Chrome extension. Yep. So we have a free, um, so we're going to have like a freemium tool coming out. And one of the big things is you're going to see on the right here, this email grader, you're going to be able to, uh, I'm trying to pull up the link right now so I can drop it in. Um, oh, here you go. Oh, somebody else got it. Yes. I'm going to drop it here. Oh, great. Cool. Uh, yeah. So this will be out soon. Nice. <laughs> uh, just go ahead and click on the link, um, sign up. It'll be, probably be out by August 1st, but you'll be able to download the extension and grade all your emails completely free from us. So, um, ensure that every email that you're sending is with best practices. And, you know, if you're still not getting open rates, just email James and he'll help you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> hit, hit me up on LinkedIn, hit me up in the email. Like I'm, I'm always so excited to talk email with people. There's so much that we can do here. Um, so, so yeah, in, in the interest of just rounding this last one out, uh, the, the, the big difference here, you know, breakup steps, uh, breakup steps are tough. You know, it's an opportunity mm -hmm. to maybe get, take one last shot at giving them another piece of value added information. The thing that's missing from this one for me is this one like starts a new thread. Uh, I never want a new thread to start with a breakup because if I get that in my inbox, I'm like, why, why am I getting dumped right now? Like, what's going on? I don't know what this is. You know, give them the opportunity to, to be able to go back and consume that information. So I would just connect this to the previous thread. Um, yeah. yeah. And so Agreed. doing that, you're, you're forwarding it or you're putting the same subject line as a previous email. Is that the it, best practice? It, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So since you're threading it, it's just going to keep that same subject line from before. Uh, into the breakup. You know, I always found like it, anytime I got a breakup message, I thought, oh no, now yeah. I'm going to lose out on like whatever yeah. info they're giving me. So like the breakup usually gets my attention because I'm like, yeah. oh no, don't forget about me. I still want to hear about you, but I don't have time right now. <laughs> yeah. It gets a lot of people's attention. Uh, we, yeah. we actually see a, a pretty sharp spike in replies at that breakup stuff. Um, and so what's like, you know, some of the best ways to optimize a breakup? Cause you know, you're you're more likely to get a response there. Yeah. Uh, is there something that you, you know, what's the biggest hack tip you, you got for us there for a break? Yeah. So, so this is, this is very personal to me and my experience, but you know, my background before landing in sales and everything, I was in the film industry and, you know, we always talk about in scripting, you want to bring everything full circle. So what I love to do is if I'm being value added all the way throughout my sequence, I've done a couple of threads. I love to come back to that first email and find out why I started and try to recontextualize mm -hmm. that statistic in the breakup to try to reignite that conversation again at the end there. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, where, um, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, go? Okay. Yeah. Um, to, to James's point, um, you know, one thing you could say is like, Hey, I, I'm assuming, uh, you know, insert pain point is not a priority for you, you know? Um, mm -hmm. If, if, if they haven't responded yet and just reiterate the pain that you're looking to solve for them or the value proposition you have and just say, hey, I'm assuming this isn't a priority right now. I'll reach back out in a couple months, right? Absolutely, 100%. And what about those, the 
the pick your own adventure like i'm assuming that either you're being chased by wolves and can't yeah <laughs> yeah the, the the multiple choice emails yeah we yeah, often yeah. deploy those in our sequences as well it's you know in a number of our you know kind of best practice based sequence templates um because again it's giving them another opportunity to either tap out of the sequence or to to be like hey like yeah sorry i'm swamped uh, let's let's connect later you know so uh, all those opportunities you can take in those levers you can pull to try to induce that response like over time, you're generating the stacking effect, you're generating the relationship stacking effect, like Rocco said, um, and getting those different touch points in there and keeping them buried uh, can help boost your, your uh, chances of success. That's great. Thank you. Well, we're nearing the end of our time together, which makes me sad. <laughs> but <laughs> well, this has been awesome. I know this, this has been, been fantastic. Great. It's been so like I've been taking notes, um, but like just if you guys want to keep the conversation going, please feel free to join us on the community where we can continue the conversation. Also, if you have questions, we had a lot of questions coming in, um, but if you didn't get questions answered, Bronco, Japes, they actually did say, yeah, look at us on LinkedIn, like drop us a line. Mm -hmm. They want to hear from you. <laughs> yeah. So tell me that's not awesome. Um, also, if you want to, like, I encourage you to jump on the sales hacker community and, and keep the conversation going, but also like join us next Thursday. Um, we're doing 30 days and 30 minutes with Rick from Demostrack. He's coming off a, a whirlwind tour where he talked about storytelling so that if you're interested in email and the stories that you, you're um, telling there, please join us then. And also Reggie AI, if anybody's out there looking for a great job, uh, Reggie is hiring. So they're always looking for great talent. So make sure that you're jumping on their website and checking them out. Sounds like a great company. I mean, if you're James Rocco, Thanks. need we say more? <laughs> appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any uh, end, uh, closing thoughts you guys want to close out with here? All right, James. You know, uh, keep... Uh, Keep testing new things. Like, don't, don't, don't get stagnant with your best practices. Best practices are. Uh, I shared this in a webinar last week. You think about, you know, driving a car off the lot. That car is losing value as soon as it gets off the lot. And the same is true about any template out there. So, continue to test. Continue to optimize. Follow the data, uh, and you'll be gold. That link did not work. Oh, that one didn't work either. And how about uh, like, one last question? Sorry. Oh, good. Thoughts on the length of this 21 day sequence? Is it too much or just enough? Uh, great, great question. Yeah, it's like the, the sweet spot is like between 16 and 23 touches or so. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, fitting that over the course of 21 to 30 days is, is usually the sweet spot there. Yeah, you see, you actually see no engagement drop until like after the, um, I think like, it's like the, I'm trying to pull step. it up. Yeah, it's like the 34th yeah. step or something. So there's a lot of ammo oh. left. A lot of folks like sh like don't um, you know end their sequences much faster than they should. Don't let their. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these all these emails are built to maximize the stacking effect. The sequence is built to maximize the stacking effect. So ensure that you are doing all the steps, and you're going to see your numbers improve in terms of contact per lead for sure. That's great. Rocco, did you want to send us home here? Any any closing thoughts? <laughs> oh, uh, closing thoughts here is this is awesome. We'd love to do this with you more often. Um, we, we really enjoyed it. If you you know need help with your sales sequences, please reach out to me or James. We're happy to look at your sales sequence. Obviously, we have a free cold email grader available coming out. So please sign up. Um, uh, we love Sales Hacker. Uh, you know, we've been a partner with you guys for so long. So thanks for having us. And, um, you know, we appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Thanks so much for attending and thanks so much for the great info and the teardown. We'll see you guys soon. <laughs>